Good morning. It is good to welcome you in the spirit of the living Christ as we gather together to worship and a welcome to those of you that are on our Zoom part of the service. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, there are some announcements that I would share with you. We're sending thank you cards to the teachers at the Migrant Center. And, and there's some on the back table if you would like to get one after the service and uh, just bring it back here and we'll see that they get there. We would ask you to just write a thank you note in there. Uh, please no gift cards because they're going to the teachers and it would be awkward if some teachers got a gift card and some didn't. So please no gift cards, just a, a word of appreciation for the job they do with with those young uh, kids. And so these next two weeks, you'll have the opportunity to get one of the gift cards and, or one of, excuse me, <laughs> one of the thank you notes uh, to, to write a thank you note to them. And, and um, gift cards will come later for something else. But right now, no gift cards. Uh, the other thing that I would share with you is uh, we've put hymnals back in, in the pews. And uh, if you'd like to use, use hymnals while we're singing our hymns, uh, I'll announce what number it is and you'll be able to do that. Um, also, next week, Cindy and I will be in Ohio in, in a time with our, our kids and grandkids and then in uh, there for a doctor's appointment, and we'll be returning late <clears throat> the following week. But it is my joy to tell you that Tom and Mary Boss, who are right here, and, and our other resident clergy couple, uh, will be leading the, the service next Sunday, and I know uh, you will be blessed with, with them as they share a special 4th of July uh, celebration with us. Those are the announcements that I would share with you. I would invite you to join me in a moment in the sharing the, the peace of Christ. We do this week in and week out, and it's so easy when we do something every week to just get caught up in going through the motions and, and knowing the words almost by heart, if not by heart. But I invite you to, to let the words sink in because they're powerful words, reminding us that we're forgiven people and that we can let, that's a choice we have, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts instead of all the other things that are competing for that. So I share with you this morning as forgiven people, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you all. We're, we're still going to use our, our distant uh, greeting with one another. The, the second Sunday of July, we'll get back to uh, moving about and extending greetings, but we're, we're going to play it safe for just a couple more weeks. Uh, I'd invite you to those who can stand to, to greet one another, make eye contact with somebody. Maybe you'd like to give them an air hug uh, or you, you'd like to wave to them or you'd like to give them the universal I love you, whatever. Just make eye contact and, and greet one another in the spirit of Christ. Let us do that together this morning. You can also blow kisses if you'd like. That's perfectly all right. In, in case you're, you're following along, the prelude is going to be different than what it's, it's um, indicated in the bulletin because the music for the prelude Karen was sharing with me is not in Florida right now, it's in Ohio. And, and as good as Karen is, she probably wants to have the music with her. 
Uh, I invite you to let the prelude open your heart and spirit to the presence of Christ in our midst. As we once again <clears throat> affirm our identity in Christ, it is my hope that week in and week out as we share this prayer that these words will become a part of us. Would you join me? Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is error, truth. Where there is doubt, faith where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying to ourselves that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 21, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5.
please be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning continues in the Gospel of Luke, and it is is good to to think about that this story follows immediately after the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which we looked at last week. And now Jesus is, is off uh, on his way. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. May God open our hearts to hear his word to us this morning. We continue to look at what it means to behave like Jesus, and today we're looking at choosing what's important. Now, I get emails from from my good friend Steve Braggington, And he sent me some recently that had one-liners from the comedian uh, Stephen Wright. And looking about at at this group this morning, I can say with certainty we're all old enough to have known who he was. Whether you did or not, I'm not going to hold you to that. But he he is uh, uh, a stand-up comedian. And here are some some of what he said. Borrow money from pessimists. They don't expect it back. 82.7% of all statistics are made up on the spot. And this is my favorite. All of you who believe in psychokinesis, raise my hand. Well, those are great one-liners for for a, a comedian But our text has a one-liner in it that will stop you in your tracks. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted about many things. This passage is a special passage. When when I left the church in, in Stowe, where Dan and Nancine were good friends and we did so many things together, we've been at their house, they've been at our house, we've, we've had times of laughter and, and done some crazy things in a, a marriage encounter group that we were both a, a part of. Uh, I went to a church up in, in uh, the Snow Belt, which was uh, a weak moment. But, but I'm glad I did, uh, because it, it turned out to be a blessing. But I had been there, oh, I don't know, maybe six or seven months, and the women's group decided to invite me to their Bible study. And, and little did I know what I was walking into. This was the passage they were looking at. And to say that they were ready for bear is kind of an understatement. I sat down, and we were all in a big circle. And the first thing they said was, what do you think of this passage, Pastor? That's a little rough way to start a Bible study. And I had enough of my wits about me to say, well, well, tell me, what do you think? 
and it was almost in unison. They said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the best part, which will not be taken away from her. Where would things be if we weren't doing all the work? Well, that's quite a way to start a Bible study. And I said, let, let me read that, that verse that you just shared with me again, but, but listen to how I read it. Martha. Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is only need of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken from her. There was silence. And if you've ever felt some people looking at you with that kind of look that goes right through you like a, a beam of light, it was there, and then one person said, Oh, maybe I understood this wrong. And that broke the ice. And we started to talk about this passage. And we started to talk about their concerns because they were. You couldn't ask for a more faithful, dedicated, devoted group of people than that circle of women I was sitting in in this Bible study. But they had spent so much of their lives busy doing things, and sadly, many of the things they did went unappreciated or unnoticed or unrecognized. But as they began to reflect on it and open up to what this passage was talking about, it was like lights started to go off. We're so busy doing things that sometimes we forget what's most important. And it's not just for women. It's for all of us because we live in a culture that values and rewards doing things. A list of accomplishments is a wonderful thing to have on a resume. But you know, as I've spent this past week with Mary Lou Boner and her son and, and Bill, and listening to some of the things that the family has said, which certainly corresponded to what I experienced with Bill. What really matters, and, and I want to say this not just in terms of them, but in terms of virtually every memorial or funeral service I've ever done, and perhaps Tom, you and Mary can bear this out as well. With one exception, which was a weird, weird funeral, <clears throat> I've never heard anybody give a list of accomplishments of a person who had died. But I've heard all kinds of people get up and share a word about a quality of a person, about kindness or generosity or, or thoughtfulness or loving or caring or special memories spent together with people. You know, we're called human beings for a reason, but we live in a culture that wants us to be human doings. 
but it is, it is the being, it is, it is who we are that really matters, not what we do or what we've accomplished or, or the accolades we have. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you, it's, it's my personal reflection that some of the most miserable people in our, in our country, and, and I don't mean miserable because of their character, I just mean miserable because uh, of what they have to go through, are the people who are famous with, with lists of accolades. I was listening to, to Cher talk uh, this week as I was driving back from Colony Cove, and, and she was talking about how much she enjoyed wearing a mask because she could go out in public and she was unrecognized. And she has a list of accomplishments longer than, than you can imagine. We get so caught up in doing that sometimes we forget what's most important. But even worse, we can get so caught up in doing that we get burned out. You've heard the, the joke about the guy who goes to the doctor and, and, and the doctor says, well, I, I can tell you what ails you and I can give you the cure. He said, let me give you the cure. You got to stop burning the candle at both ends. And the guy says, do you have any other suggestions, doc? Well, we, we live in, in a culture where people get burned out and used up. So much energy is given in a, in a job that there's nothing left for home. Or so much energy is put into to doing things that we miss out on what is most important. My good friend and mentor, Bishop Thomas, used to say it this way, we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. And that's the truth. We get so carried away about doing things, and either we get burned out, or we end up with, with a deep yearning sense of being unfulfilled. Because no matter how long the list of accomplishments might be, they're seldom fulfilling. And if they are fulfilling, it's incredibly interesting how short-lived that is. As, as some of you know, I'm, I'm a big Tampa Bay Lightning fan. And thank goodness the game was on Friday night, not last night, so I got a good night's sleep last night. And I'm so excited that they're back in the Stanley Cup Finals. And if I, I had a, a, a lightning sweater, or jersey as most people will call them, I would have worn it today, except as I've lost weight, it's too big and I gave it to a son. But... I'm so excited they're back in the Stanley Cup Finals. They're the defending champions. But what they did last year doesn't matter a hoot this year. All that success and excitement and fun is temporary. They've got to do it again this year, I hope. But if they repeat, we'll enjoy it and we'll celebrate but next year when the season begins, what happened this year won't matter a bit. And how true that is in so much of life, what we do, if it doesn't burn us out, it's temporary and, and lacks that sustaining, fulfilling power that gives us a sense of significance and, and like we, we've really connected to life. So what's the alternative? And Mary embodies it. 
It's to spend time with Jesus. To spend time with Jesus. And, and if we're going to behave like him, we can learn from what he has done. Jesus didn't spend all his time with the crowds or with disciples. There are times when he would go away, even though the crowds were clamoring for more, he would go away to be renewed, to, to reconnect with God, to be filled and refilled with God's power. We are called to spend time with Jesus. To steal away. To make sure that we have that special time. And the danger is we can get so caught up in all the things that, that we think are urgent but aren't really important that it can get in the way unless, unless we decide right from the start that we're going to make it a priority. Because when all is said and done, it really is the only priority that matters because it sets the stage for everything else. So how in the world do we spend time with Jesus? Well, one of the ways is to make it a practice to read the Gospels. You don't have to read a Gospel in a full sitting. You could take a few verses at a time. You could take a story at a time and work your way through. But don't do it to get done. Do it to reflect, to listen, to let it wash over you. To begin to ask questions like, how does this compare to the way I'm living? What, what might God be wanting me to learn from this passage? That's especially good when you bump up against a passage that rubs you the wrong way. Those are gems for asking, what does God want me to learn? But read the Gospels. I'm not saying ignore the rest of the Bible. But it's my judgment that we ought to spend about 75% of our time reading and rereading the Gospels. Then once you do that, you're going to begin to understand what Paul has to say and James and Peter and John. It's going to make more sense. It's going to speak deeper to you. And believe it or not, when, you, when you're in depth in the Gospels, the Old Testament starts to take on new meaning as well. Too often people pluck a verse, typically out of Paul, here or there, or maybe Peter, and, and act as if that's the center of the New Testament. It's not. It's, it's a branch on the tree, but the trunk and the roots are found in the Gospels. And if you're worried about reading and rereading a gospel, let me assure you that you can reread a gospel, and I promise you, I guarantee to you, that you will see things on a second time that you never saw on a first time, and you'll ask yourself and scratch your head, how did I miss that? And if you do it a third time, the same thing will happen, and a fifth time, the same thing will happen, and a tenth time, the same will thing will happen. That's because the Holy Spirit is at work. So one of the ways we spend time with Jesus is reading the Gospels intentionally, and then the rest of the Scripture as well, but intentionally the Gospels. And the second way is spending time in listening prayer listening prayer, not talking prayer, but listening prayer. Obviously, I wasn't there, but I sincerely doubt that Jesus ever went for a time of quiet prayer 
with God and gave God a laundry list of things that were happening or concerns that he had. I think Jesus went to times of prayer with God to listen, to be renewed and recharged and empowered. Listening prayer is, is when we get quiet. And a good way to get quiet is, is to breathe. And there's a simple breathing technique that I, I share whenever I, I do the Keep Your Brain Healthy workshop. And it's called 457 Breathing. You breathe in for a count of four, you hold it for a count of five, and you exhale for a count of seven. Do that about three or four times. Never, ever, ever, never do it when you're driving the car. If you're watching a bad TV show, it's a good time to do it. But <clears throat> in all seriousness, as a way of, of getting into listening prayer, it's a wonderful way to just quiet our spirits and then begin to just ask a, a question like, Lord, what do you want me to hear? Or make a, a simple statement, Lord, speak to me. And then just listen. You can keep on breathing if you start get to, getting distracted, which you will. Just go back to breathing. Now, sometimes you'll get an answer quicker than you can believe. But there are other times that answer might come in a day or two, or an hour or two, or a week or two. But when it comes, you'll know it. You'll know it. And that's what it means to spend time with Jesus in prayer. There are times when we want to share our concerns, of course. But let the foundation be listening, not talking. Let the foundation be a time for us to receive, not to inform. Because you and I never inform Christ of anything. It's already known. As we receive, we become transformed over time. It doesn't happen like that, but it does happen. And it is real. And it is life-changing and transforming and renewing. Mary spent her time listening to Jesus. we all will do better if we spend more of our time listening to him as well. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us come together in a time of prayer. Lord, as we gather those images of Surfside are so shocking, so terrifying. They almost defy our words. We ask you to be with all in a very special way in, in these hours and days and weeks that lie ahead. To those who may be survivors trapped in rubble, we ask that you will bring comfort and strength and courage For those feeling pain, we ask you to, to bring relief to that pain. For those who are terrified, we ask you to bring your peace. 
and for those families who have ones who who are in limbo, they don't know whether their loved ones are alive or dead, we ask you to surround them with, with your comfort, with your peace, with your strength. Touch their hearts and spirits in very concrete and particular ways that they will know that you are with them and that your love surrounds and sustains them no matter what the outcome might be. For all who are losing hope, renew their hope. And for those who know that loved ones have died, whose hearts are broken and grieving, touch them with the reality of Easter, the reality of the resurrection, regardless of their faith experience. Let them each know in a very special way that You are with them, and their loved ones are safe in your hands and heart. And be with the first responders who are putting themselves in harm and danger's way. Renew them when their strength wanes. Renew their hope when frustration and, and discouragement seem to get in the way. Keep them all safe. And let them be a part of miracles in their work. Finding those alive that they can and bringing them to safety. And be with all the leaders who are part of that community. Elevate them above placing blame to finding solutions to doing all that they can do to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. And as we continue to pray week in and week out, we pray for all our leaders at every level of government, make them servant leaders, fill them with compassion and grace and humility Give them bold visions of what you would desire. Help them put aside the things that divide. Liberate them from the clutches and the allures of power. And make them your servants. And elevate them to be the very best leaders they can be. And we lift up these and all our prayers in the name and spirit of our Lord Jesus the Christ. And we pray together the prayer he has shared and taught across the generations and thousands of years. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 508. I would invite all who are able to stand to do so as we sing this together and uh
It's 508 in the hymnal if you'd like to use a hymnal. me in our benediction. Wherever we go, we go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a promise in our being there. Christ who dwells within us has something he wants to do through us where we are. And now as we go forth, I invite you to believe this and to go in the joy of God's grace, the joy of God's power, and the joy of God's love. So be it. you to be seated for the postlude and allow our, our elders to go to the back of the church to, to greet you on, on the way out in a few moments. Mm -hmm. 